Darius Wasafi with Retail Tech Podcast, uh, speaking with Liad Agmon, CEO of Dynamic Yield. Welcome, Liad. Uh, please uh, give an intro on what uh, Dynamic Yield does and how you help retailers. Yes. So, uh, hello. It's uh, I'm great. Uh, I'm glad we are speaking, Darius. Um, Dynamic Yield is a personalization platform, which is a kind of today is a general term uh, for creating one-to-one -one experiences uh, across multiple channels so as a company we are uh, a SaaS platform that allows our e-commerce and i would say omni-channel retailers to treat users as who they really are and change the experience so each individual gets the experience that is best catered to their expectations Okay, great. So, um, of course, omni-channel is a uh, sometimes really widely used uh, term. Um, let's see, for example, you know, from the point of view of personalization, uh, what do you actually do, for example, to personalize the experience? Is it down to the individual user or to a cohort? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and it's actually it's something that we help our customers demystify. The way we look at the world, there are what we call segmented experiences where you design an experience for a specific cohort. For example, people from New York whose lifetime value is more than $2,000 or people that arrive from a specific Facebook campaign and are first-time visitors to the website. These are cohorts that are defined by the marketing team and you can shape experience for these cohorts. On the other hand, you have the one-to-one -one experiences. So if you think about product catalog, I may have 50,000 SKUs in my catalog, but in a specific email, I only have a room for four product recommendations. So how do I choose the best four products out of a 50,000 product catalog per each individual email? This is the one-to-one -one aspect of personalization. Okay, great. So, so you do both basically. You Correct. It depends on the client and what their products are and who their, I guess, optimum customer is. Yeah, yeah. The way we look at the world, especially in the omni-channel world, there are two main challenges that we have uh, that we help to solve. One is that the data sets today are disconnected. And again, I I, I was a VP of uh, of new services at Sears after I sold to them my my search engine uh, company, um, and I experienced it firsthand. I wanted to connect the data from my email program to the data of my merchandising tools on the website. I wanted to connect the loyalty program where we had credit cards to the web experience so I can use the data from these different channels to create a unified experience, and I just couldn't do it. There, there, were, there were no tools in the market that helped me connect all these dis disparate data sets into a unified view of the customer. So this is the first channel we solve for. How do we connect all these data points in a way that is easy and lightweight? No one wants to go through a six months integration project. It has to be something that is very simple uh, uh, to do with very minimal effort on the, on the IT part of the organization. The second part, which is the biggest challenge is Let's now just assume that I already have a unified data source, a unified data set. How do I, as a marketing manager or as a merchandiser, change the experience in the web, uh, in an app, um, without it being a developer, uh, a heavy project? I don't want to use IT anytime I want to change the experience for a specific segment because IT is a bottleneck everywhere you go. How do I do it? How do you empower the marketing team to make these changes by themselves without it being a project? This is the second biggest problem, or I'd say this is the number one problem that our customers have, and it comes, you can start solving for it once you solve the data problem. Okay. Now, you mentioned lightweight and not a major project. Correct. Uh, I mean, the first challenge you mentioned is the... Uh, connecting all the disparate uh, data sets that is you know the i guess on, on the conceptual side that's that can be a huge project itself how do you actually make it lightweight so um 
in, in, in the basis of our platform, we are also a full-blown data management platform. So we are a DMP that can connect with any other data source, whether it is third-party DMPs like Oracle's Blue Kai uh, or, you know, or a Lotomy or a Crux. Uh, or any type of experience or data store that organizations have. So if you take, for example, CRM integration, I, this, all modern CRMs today, they have pretty uh, standard APIs uh, from which you can fetch data. So we basically tap into the existing APIs of CRMs or other data stores, and then we created a system where we can normalize the data on our end and we basically move the burden from the IT team of our customer to our professional services team who are experts at doing it very fast. Um, so it is not anything that is like you, you click a button and it's, and it's automated, but, you, um, but on our customers, and they just need to provide us with the uh, connector, you know, whether it's an API or, um, or any, con any technical mm -hmm. connector, and we take the data and we can parse it and normalize it and, and make it accessible. Okay, so I mean that that's uh, definitely something that's on, on top of a lot of people's mind these days is how to use the APIs and what's also called uh, microservices to really optimize their operations. But the fact is that many companies don't have the API capabilities, especially the, uh, you know, uh, legacy systems. So how do you, how do you handle it with legacy systems? Yeah. So we have not experienced yet a situation where the data is so siloed that it cannot be extracted. Most of the problems reside usually that legacy systems are three layers, or I'd say they are disconnected. They are three hops away from the actual web experience. So the question is not uh, much of whether you can take the data out from this system, which is completely um, possible, is how do I then get it closer to the customer, to the experience itself? So uh, even with, we had some crazy legacy systems uh, in our experience in the last five years, but it is some, I would say to the, in the most extreme case, we had, um, we had to uh, kind of create a small, um, software solution that connected to a specific server, fetch the data, and then use just, you know, the standard APIs with JSON to actually sync it back to our main uh, main data store. But the, and this is like the most complex scenarios, like with the normal scenarios where a lot of the data is either in Salesforce or sometimes in the ESP, so in many ca cases, responses or exact target, they hold a lot of customer related data. We have been doing it for so many years now. It's it's really a, a very streamlined process. Uh, so it's it's a long way of answering that. Uh, to answer that, we have seen a lot of crazy challenges in the past five years, and uh, and it's pretty it's pretty doable and it's doable fast. Okay, yeah, I mean definitely things are changing and they're they're going in the right direction. Most of the newer modern uh, software are, you know, REST API enabled. So, which makes it a lot easier for all of our lives are easier. Yeah, and more things are getting connected. I don't know if you noticed uh, today, but the demand work got acquired yesterday by Salesforce. Yeah. Yes. So, so if you think about what is the play there, the play is that Salesforce, basically they want to own also the experience part. They want to own the kind of, they want to own the end-to-end -end experience from the user experience all the way to the CRM. And the way these systems are going to get connected is through APIs. Um, and um, and so these companies have already all the APIs in place, um, and it's so it's a, it's a pretty straightforward process. I would say that the bigger problem uh, that we have uh, with our customers, which we help solve, is that they need advice as what to do. Uh, it's even before the technic the technical aspects. It's really more about okay. So let's assume that I can connect all these different data sources. What do I do with it now as a marketing person? How do I connect? my in-store experience with my um, in-app experience. How are they, these two are related? And this is where we have our consulting team that helps you. We basically go for a workshop. Even before we start working together, we go for a workshop with the different departments and we do some whiteboard uh, 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 planning on assuming the technical parts are, are, are over with, 
what do we actually want to achieve? And what we see is that it's very a very interesting uh, process because suddenly they can do things that they could never imagine before that were possible. And the ideas that start flowing create a lot of excitement in the room. So uh, if I understand you correctly, you basically you have a cloud based platform, you connect to the different uh, sides or pieces of the customer's ecosystem, you pull the data that is required to be able to provide your recommendations to the marketing team or to have them design the different mm -hmm. systems. So you you basically do you how do you make sure that the data is secure on your servers? Because it's customer data, correct? Yeah. Um, yes. So we store PII, we don't store PCI. So we don't store credit card information. We don't care about the credit card information. We only store PII. Um, and the way we ensure it is like, you know, the, the best, uh, I would say, practices of the industry. First of all, we have a large uh, development team in Israel. Israel is a security, uh, um, you know, like heaven in a sense, like so many security companies. So there is a lot of know-how within the industry on how to securely store data. The second part is also certification. So we go through certification processes with uh, different types of certification processes. And also it depends on geography. You've got different processes in Germany, different processes in the US. Um, and we do our best to make sure that we adhere to every standard in the industry to connect the data, uh, to protect the data. Um, we have a lot, of, I mean, I cannot disclose some, the names of some of our largest and most sensitive customers, but these are Fortune 50 companies that are super, super um, cautious about uh, these type of scenarios. Um, and, and we are held to the highest uh, standards. So, yeah, I think that's, um, I mean, it's obvious that's probably one of the first questions any CIO or CTO is going to ask you. So I'm yeah. sure you've addressed that. I just wanted to uh, reconfirm it and see how you actually, you know, so for example, let's say you're a U.S. company and you have customers coming out of Europe. The, the transfer of data, the PII admissible by EU standards is different than uh, U.S. So, yeah, and I think this is a this is an advantage for that we have as a global company. So our customers range from, you know, from Singapore, I'm um, going like uh, um, mm -hmm. east to west. So we Singapore, India, uh, Israel, Germany, Switzerland, the UK, the US. Uh, we, uh, we also have big customers in Russia. We, have, we are operating in so many different geographies now that we already have done the homework on how, how to scale globally, also in terms of the local compliance and regulations. But, but, but realistically, um, we have not had any pushback from the CIO and their team. It's more of a technical check mark as part of the, pro of the process. The, the way we work um, is we, our customers are the marketing teams. Um, and with marketing, I always say that let's, let's walk before we run. So we, we focus on how do we create the highest amount of value in less than 90 days because this is what sometimes is required. If you think about the VP of marketing or the VP of e-commerce, if they manage to show a significant uplift in revenue in 90 days, then they get buying from anyone else in the organization for their more complex integrations. So the way we usually start, we start with a web first deployment. We don't require any connection to any third party data source. We are deployed on the site just like Google, uh, analytics or Omniture, we collect all the data ourselves. And only the only thing we need is a, is a product feed um, and the pixel being fired on purchase and we enable the entire web experience. So um, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, let me think of an example I can disclose. I'll take La Moda, which is the, the, the biggest uh, e-commerce play uh, in, uh, in Russia. It's part of Rocket Internet Group. They showed $5 million additional revenue in the first 90 days after you show that amount of revenue up in 90 days we got buying from all the departments to go deeper and i think for the year for the first nine months it was 11 million dollars and then i think for the entire year 15 million dollars uplift in revenue by the way net revenue so after returns 
and cost of goods. And when you have such a, like such a massive increase in revenue without a lot of effort internally, then basically the marketing team now basically they get anything they want. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's great to be able to show that in, in the 90 days. 90 days is a relatively short time period in enterprise, at least, uh, applications. So um, now, so what is, what is the typical implementation yeah. range of, you know, your, your projects with your customers? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain in a minute, but just kind of to, to address uh, the, the note that you mentioned, the reason why I focus so much when we started the company on the 90 day value is because as a VP at Sears, I would get pitched by literally 50 vendors a month. You know, I had vendor fatigue. And everyone with their promises, oh, it's an easy, just place a tag on a website. You just have to connect these two systems. And, and, and I'm sure that they were all honest in their intentions. But my attention span, when I have to really, I have, I'm going to deploy only two or three projects a year. Because if you think about a large organization, just how much attention can you put to a new project? You need to make your decisions. And, and, and I saw that I am inclined to go with vendors where there was very um, fast route to integration and to see value. And if they could have done show me value upfront without me doing a lot of work on my end or my team's resources, then I was more inclined to work with them. So, so when I started Dynamic Yield, I said, if I'm the target customer for this type of a solution, I need this company to have the same philosophy. And, and, and now going to your question, for you to start working with Dynamic Yield, we had customers that signed with us at 9 a.m. and were live at 4 p.m. Because all you have to do is really three or four things. You push our tag, either through a tag manager or it's directly in your template. You fire a purchase pixel uh, so we know that I, we can connect it and attribute personalization to the, to the revenue. Because at the end of the day, the goal of personalization is to increase revenue. And then if you want to deploy product recommendations, whether in email or on the web, we need, a, your, you need, we need your product feed, which everyone has already today because they push it to Google PLA, they push it around. So everyone that we know has a product feed available. And these are the only three things that you need to get started and to already start generating revenue from Dynamic Yield. If you want to use us on the traffic acquisition side, you can also connect a subdomain to our system, which again is a two minute effort by someone in the IT department, routing a subdomain to Dynamic Yield. And then you can use a lot of our traffic acquisition capabilities that optimize incoming traffic, that optimize creatives on third party sites and so on and so forth. That's all you need. Okay, well that's, I mean, that's pretty powerful. And the, the way that um, the customers actually start to get access to the data that you're capturing and the, you know the, the, the way that you present it to them is that through your own like dashboard that they log into correct so so when you think about the data and the dashboards etc it's uh, the exact same process with the google analytics uh, deployment once you push the tag you start seeing data in real time now the but, but if we remember what we discussed earlier in our call, we are not an analytics platform. We are an experience management platform. So at the moment you push the tag, you can start make changes to the banners on your homepage. You can start creating segmented rules. So I could say a traffic that arrives from California, let's take weather as an example, which is super important in fashion. If the temperatures are above 50 degrees, then you can show on the homepage certain creatives. If the temperatures are below 50 degrees, we can show other creatives. We are in charge of the weather APIs and it depends on the local, on the location of the person browsing the website, they're going to get a different homepage experience. This is an example of, of something you can do literally out of the box after two minutes with our platform. Okay, so that's, I guess my next question is that obviously the, the, the people that use your software are, are marketing and merchandising or just marketing? Yes, no marketing and merchandising. When it comes to product recommendations and to category page recommendations, um, it is the merchandising team. When it comes to promotions, uh, homepage and banners across the website, it is the marketing team. 
Um, it's a marketing team that ultimately m creates the experience. Is that correct? Yes, and this is another part of the uh, of of the flow that we solve for. So, if you think about a marketing team today, they can only control the they, the the experience on the website through the CMS, which is one experience for all. If as a marketing person I want to create different experiences for my you know high value customers versus my first time visitors, I just technically can't do it because my CMS doesn't support it. So we become a de facto CMS on top of CMS, and we allow them to create these experiences. And we also solve for the fact that you don't need to know HTML or you know any coding to, to do it because your development team or our professional services team can create the templates that you need, and then you can just create rich experiences by typing in the content like you would do in a WordPress blog. It's a, it's a very simplified process. And it goes back to my philosophy, which is the people in the marketing and merchandising team, they're super smart, but they are not technical. They're, they are not data scientists, they are not developers, but they want to have stronger tools that they can use on a day-to-day -day basis without having to rely on the analytics team to generate once a month a nice PowerPoint with reports on what happened in the last 30 days. They want to have direct access to data and they want to have direct access to experimentation and data-driven uh, experiences and they just, this is why they love us uh, because they, they suddenly have this whole new set of capabilities that they just couldn't do before. Right, so going back to the Lamora um, example that you mentioned, yeah. can you tell me a little bit more about how they actually achieved the uptick in, in the revenues? How, how did it, in, in, you know, like what exactly was it like the, to the same customers, repeat customers actually were able to buy more or larger order size or? So, so yeah, so let's talk about La Moda because every retailer has a bit of a different kind of a philosophy as a retailer. Specifically La Moda, they, they are selling products of different brands and, and a, very, a lot of different styles. They have 100,000 SKUs. So they sell Nike and they sell Adidas and they sell Under Armour. Um, and they sell, you know, um, Prada maybe, I'm just inventing right mm -hmm. now, but they're selling all these different brands. So one thing is that they wanted to know per each visitor, what is the user affinities? Are you more inclined towards a Nike brand or a Reebok brand? You know, it's, um, it's something that actually, like for example, I'm a big Under Armour fan. So I, if, if I had to choose, I would always go with an Under Armour product. Right. Uh, so the affinities of users to specific brands there is the affinity of user, whether you are a value shopper or you're someone who buys this, the newest products. So as you browse the website, you're actually leaving breadcrumbs behind that tell me what type of a customer you are. You went to a category page and you sorted the products from low to high. I know that you're someone that looks to buy cheap products. Mm. And it's okay, I'm that kind of a person too. Um, if you're someone who is always opting out for newest, it's a different person. Then how do you get to the website? If I go to uh, lamoda.com versus if I arrive from a Google campaign, I have a very different context as a user. Someone who goes directly to lamoda.com is someone who knows the brand, probably purchased before, and comes with an intent whether to discover new products or to search for a specific product. If I arrive from a, mar a marketing campaign, I may have zero knowledge about the brand, and I just have a more specific need. I'm looking for running shoes. So we take all this data, and then, first of all, we, we expose the information uh, uh, to the marketing team, and then we allow them to change the logic in the experience. So if you arrive from a Google campaign and it's your first visit on the website, I may actually lead with a coupon with a deep discount to get you to become a first-time purchaser. Um, if you are someone who comes to La Moda uh, directly, and I know you have an affinity for Nike products, and I have five new Nike shoes uh, in stock, I may lead with a Nike-related offer on the homepage because I know based on your past uh, purchases and browsing history that this would go, go a long way with you. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a really important uh, factor. Uh, I always like to like, find out a little bit more detail how things are actually done. So that's good to know. Um, it also reminds me of, uh, 
I think from everybody's experience, the job of a marketing people is like one of the hardest jobs these days. Uh, yeah. And it's not getting any easier. So this, what you're doing, I think is definitely addressing that specific thing. And you know, it's, I mean, other than product, marketing is the next thing is to make a company successful. So I think what you're doing is really adds a lot of value to the, to the organization. So this is good. It also reminds me of the impact of the uh, big data. Um, I just uh, like started reading a book by a gentleman called Martin Lindstrom, I think, uh, that basically he talks about the challenges to take big data and translate it into small data so that it could be consumed correctly, which is really, you know, sounds like what you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a super important notion. You know, if I look at in, in our company, we have, you know, five data scientists. We have an engineering team of data scientists that also write code and they use R and they use all these type of things that for me, and I'm a technical guy, I don't understand half of the data science, you know, that they use, right? And because it's not my specialty. I need to think in simpler terms. So what I expect from companies like Dynamic Yield is to be big data companies that crunch the data and provide me with insights that I can digest easily and with suggested call to actions that I can translate into activity. And, and, and this goes again by connecting data to the experience. It does not help me that my data science tells me, oh, I, I don't know, I see this fluctuation in yield over the last 30 days. If me as a marketing person, I cannot translate it into a call to action using my own tool set, um, then it's not super valuable. Right. And this is exactly that. It's connecting the science with what the marketer actually can do on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. Um, and and this, is, this is a big trend that we are seeing as well. Right. I mean, it, we, it has to be like that or we're just we're drowning in data. And we yeah, make and sense of it, you know. Exactly. And the most absurd thing in 2016 is that, think about it, they are called digital marketing teams, you know, e-commerce, but they don't have any developers reporting to them, which is insane. How can you be a marketing team in 2016 without developers reporting to you? Because everything you do has to do with digital experiences. And you have to rely on favors from other departments <laughs> To allocate like someone for two hours to do your job, and it's it's a uh, and and it it holds them back, and so they on one hand they need they are being asked to be faster, more sophisticated, more data driven, and you know with the same budget to get to better results. On the other hand, their hands are tied, and, and this is one thing that I see that happens a lot is that we become kind of the you know the A team of the marketing team because we can put in a lot of development power under specific requests by our customers and it is part of the marketing budget and we deliver it fast and they don't have to rely on their own IT teams. Uh, and this is, this is massive in the value it's creating for our customers. Right. Yeah. I mean, they need to be agile really in how they run their business. And this is what uh, really does it, gets it done for them. Yeah. So um, we're coming upon time. Um, uh, just maybe in closing, if you can maybe tell me a little bit about more like uh, the evolution of Dynamic Yield from when you started and then what's, what are your goals? What, uh, you know, what's in the future, two, three years? Uh, uh, yeah. So it's funny. Um, the, uh, so when I left Sears, I joined Bessemer Venture Partners, which is one of the top investors in the U.S. Um, you know, diapers.com, right. LinkedIn, Skype, Pinterest. Um, and I and I thought, you know, for a long time about the personalization problem, and and funny, um, the actually the catalyst was the New York Times when they introduced their paywall about four or five years, no, actually five and a half years ago, and I it was a strange move because I thought, why do they only show the paywall after twenty page views? Why not ten? If someone like myself who shares an article. I actually send traffic to the New York Times. Maybe I shouldn't get the paywall. And then I started researching into the CMS uh, that publishers have and that, re uh, that other e-commerce platforms have. Um, and I was shocked to see that how far they are behind. Most of the platforms in the market were written when we played Snake on our Nokia phones. 
You know, we are in 2016, we have now uh, iPhones and we have Apple Watches and we still go to the same experience. And this was the catalyst. So if you think about your experience on Facebook or Pinterest or Twitter, there is no concept of a page view anymore. It is a streamlined, personalized experience. And I just, we identify this massive technology gap that was waiting for disruption. So this is how we started. So we started with changing the experience and then as we go deeper, we realized we need to have more, even more data on the customer. Now, the interesting thing in e-commerce, and it's something that also we look a lot, is Pareto. About 80% of the visitors to an e-commerce website are first-time visitors. But 80% of the revenue is driven by the 20% who come repeatedly. So the more data you have on the customer actually also means that the customer is more valuable and his expectation from the brand is higher. Um, and, and it just got us basically to think about these problems deeper and deeper. And, and you know, with some of our large US customers who are also thought leaders, we just, all we had to do is go in the room and ask them, what is hurting you right now? And what problems would you like to solve? And we, we just needed to build these solutions. So it's very customer driven a lot of the work we've done. Okay, and where do you see things going in the next maybe three to five years? Uh, yeah, it's going to consolidate. Um, you see a lot today, a lot of um, uh, e-commerce companies or a lot of, I would say, uh, commerce companies, omnichannel ones, they use too many endpoints. They use too many vendors for, for so you have an email personalization vendor, you have you know a website personalization vendor, you have a merchandising solution, you have an in-app, uh, just too much stuff. One, it's expensive. Two, the total cost of ownership is high. And three, they don't speak with each other. So I think it's gonna consolidate. There's gonna be um, a few solutions, and I hope Dynamic is gonna be the leading one, but time will tell, that will provide you with an end-to-end view of the customer and an end-to-end -end experience uh, um, in terms of shaping the experience of the customer. When you are in store and you open the app, I should recognize that you're in the store. I should recognize your, your purchase history and I should direct you to the right places in the store physically. When I'm sending you an email, the email should be relevant to you. So there's going to be fewer vendors that are going to control much bigger parts of the experience. And I think that the Salesforce demand where acquisition shows that probably others are thinking the same. Right. And then maybe there, there will still be specialized providers, but they don't have to go through the customer all by themselves. So you could actually be the, the connector. Yes, exactly. The, the way internally we look at ourselves as a personalization operating system, we want to be the glue uh, yeah. to connect the dots. And it's super important. Um, and, you know, I'll give a different example. My cousin founded a company called Checkpoint, which is the biggest uh, information security company in the world uh, today. And, and Checkpoint did the same strategy. They have the Checkpoint firewall, but they allowed other vendors to connect to the firewall, which became the, became the middleware. And, and we use the same strategy here in Dynamic Yield. We are today, we are still not the size of Checkpoint or, or Salesforce, so we build the end-to-end -end experiences, but we already start to see a trend where we become the middleware and other uh, companies integrate with us when they want to work with our customers. And I think this trend is going to continue. Okay, yeah, I, I really like that term, the personalization operating system. Ah, thank that's, you. Uh, that's pretty cool. Well, thank you so much, Liad. It was uh, great talking. I mean, we could, I could go on for hours and pick your brain, but I know you don't have time. So I appreciate it and look forward to hearing more and more awesome news from Dynamic Yield. Thank you so much, Darius. It was a real pleasure.